Okay, let's start the class then. So in the last class, uh, we did talk about Ruby laser and helium neon laser. So if we want to make a comparison between these two lasers, one simple difference is that this is a three level laser. Whereas this is going to be a four level laser. If you talk about helium neon laser, the light that is going to be emitted from helium neon laser, this is going to be more directional and more monochromatic. I'll tell you why is that so. As compared to this case here. The reason being that in the case of helium neon laser, you had very uh, well defined excited levels, right? Because you were talking about the excited uh, levels of helium or excited levels of neon. So they are very well defined and very sharply defined. Whereas Ruby laser being a solid state laser, if you remember while drawing the level diagram, I actually drew the broader energy levels in the case of Ruby laser. The reason again being that because this is a solid state laser and you have aluminum oxide, Right? So usually in that case, you have this in which some of these aluminum atoms are basically replaced by the chromium. Hence, you have the actually the kind of wider bands in the case of ruby laser as compared to the helium neon laser. And on the top of that, because this is a crystal and you cannot have a perfect crystals. So there are going to be certain imperfections in the crystal. There could be, for example, lattice distortions. Ho sakte hain aapke. That means that the structure you uh, expect that the aluminum and oxide ke beech mein jo bones banenge, there might be some kind of irregularity in those kind of things. You can have the crystalline imperfections. etc. And this is not very specific to ruby laser. This is true for any solid state laser. Koi bhi ap solid state laser loge, to usme crystals honge. And crystals mein usually lattice hoegi. Aapki lattice hai, wo perfect lattice nahi hoegi. And because of that, the light that you are going to get in the case of ruby laser, it will not be as directional and as monochromatic as would be in the case of helium neon laser. Because helium neon laser is a gaseous laser, so you are individual helium and neon atoms to excite karne ki basically. Baat kar rahe. The third difference would be here, because you are using a xenon flash lamp, so your output is going to be a pulsed output. Whereas in the case of helium neon laser, your output is going to be a continuous output. So these are going to be the differences between ruby laser and helium neon laser. There are numerous applications of laser, which we discussed in the beginning. Pointer hote hai, medical mein use hota hai, aapka laser surgeries hoti hai, welding ke liye use karte hai, soldering ke liye use karte hai. There are very large laser printers hote hai. So there are going to be very large applications of laser. Aap jo supermarket mein shopping karne jate hai, pe jo barcode scanners hote hai, Wo basically aapke laser hota hai usme. But aapke slavers mein jo do important application hai. The first one is optical communication. For example, aap radio sunte hai. Usme aapke amplitude modulated ya frequency modulated jo hote hai. Wo aapke signals hote hai. So usually what you have is that you have an audio signal. And just go up transmit karna hai to the point where receiver is present, right? Agar aap FM ki baat karte hai, so kahi se there is a song being played, and suppose we are the receiver, so the song is going to be played on our mobile phone or the radio, anything over there. So, the, for transmission of this signal, there are two math, 
there are actually three amplitude frequency and phase also but uh, one of them is for example the frequency modulation which basically means that you have another signal jisko aap bolte ho carrier wave carrier wave sorry ye jo aapki jo carrier wave hoti hai ye ye jo audio signal hai isko carry karti hai and ye aapko receiver tak pahunchati hai the signal is sent to the receiver and that basically means that aap is carrier wave ka you can change the frequency of this carrier wave you can change the amplitude of this carrier wave according to the audio signal audio signal ke accordingly ya to aap iski frequency change kar sakte ho ya aap iska amplitude change kar sakte ho agar aap frequency change karte ho to usko frequency modulation bolte ho aur agar aap amplitude change karte ho to usko amplitude modulation bolte hain kyunki ab aap basically apni carrier wave ki frequency ya amplitude ko modulate kar rahe ho as per the audio signal फिर जब वो रिसीवर के पास में सिग्नल पहुंचता है एट दैट पॉइंट फिर उसका डिमोडुलेशन किया जाता है एंड ये ऑडियो सिग्नल है इसको वापस एक्सट्रैक्ट किया जाता है नाउ दिस कैरियर वेव यू वुड लाइक टू हैव द फ्रीक्वेंसी विथ व्हिच वी डिफाइंड एज लाइन विथ आल्सो व्हाइल टॉकिंग अबाउट द कोहेरेंस ऑफ द लेजर और स्पेक्ट्रल विथ दिस शुड बी एज स्मॉल एज पॉसिबल क्योंकि कैरियर वेव की अपनी एक फ्रीक्वेंसी होगी एंड नाउ वी नो दैट कि किसी की भी एब्सोल्यूट फ्रीक्वेंसी नहीं होती है देर इज सम एसोसिएटेड प्लस माइनस डेल्टा न्यू विद एवरी सिंगल फ्रीक्वेंसी अब ये आपका डेल्टा न्यू जितना लार्ज होगा उतने ही आपकी नॉइजेस आपके यहाँ पे आने स्टार्ट हो जाएंगी कम्युनिकेशन में सो यू वुड लाइक टू हैव अ कैरियर वेव इन विच योर डेल्टा न्यू इज वेरी स्मॉल एंड वी नो from our previous lectures where we discussed the properties of the laser that laser has this delta nu very small hence laser can be used as a carrier wave for carrying the signal the audio signal from point of origin to the point of destination benefit kya hoga ki laser ka delta nu bahut small hai to aapki receiver ke paas mein जब आपका सिग्नल पहुंचेगा तो उसमें जो नॉइज इंट्रोड्यूस होगी दैट वुड बी कंपेरेटिवली मच मच स्मॉलर। सो दिस इज वन एप्लीकेशन ऑफ लेजर द सेकंड एप्लीकेशन दैट इज इन योर सिलेबस इज ऑप्टिकल अलाइनमेंट लेजर इन द केस ऑफ लेजर द डाइवर्जेंस इज नेक्लिजिबल डाइवर्जेंस नेग्लिजिबल है दैट मीन्स अगर आप लेजर की लाइट यहां से स्टार्ट करते हो एंड एट द पॉइंट ऑफ डेस्टिनेशन तक आपकी लेजर में जो स्प्रेड होगा दैट इज गोइंग टू बी वेरी वेरी स्मॉल दैट इज मेड बाई द डाइवर्जेंस बींग वेरी वेरी स्मॉल इन दैट केस हैंस यू कैन यूज द लेजर लाइट फॉर गाइडिंग द मशीन इन सच अ वे दैट इफ यू वॉन्ट समथिंग टू बी एक्सट्रीमली एक्सट्रीमली होरिजोंटल देन लेजर कैन बी यूज एज अ गाइडिंग टूल इन दैट केस or if there is a building which is going to be extremely extremely tall in that case also you can use the laser light as a guiding tool to make it exactly vertical so if you want something with kind of extreme extreme accuracy and sensitivity then laser can be used as a guiding tool for those kind of measurements or those kind of applications that is your second application of laser which is uh, part of your slavers now i'm going to move on to the next unit which is quantum mechanics anyone has any doubt in laser so far uh, ma'am in the optical communication laser is uh, behaving as a carrier wave yes uh, okay uh, and ma'am uh, Oh, like why the del nu should be small for the laser wave uh, for the like optical communication purpose like why there is a requirement to have it small kyunki aapka jitna delta nu large hoga aap utni zyada frequency range ko carry kar rahe ho from this point to this point aur jaise jaise aap fm range badhate jaoge aap utne hi zyada noise 
आपके उसमें इंक्लूड होनी स्टार्ट हो जाएगी ओके मैम राइट इफ आई हैव ओनली दिस मच विथ तो आपके जो नॉइजेस इंट्रोड्यूस होंगे वो सिर्फ इस विथ के विद इन होंगे और अगर आपका डेल्टा न्यू लार्ज है देन आपकी नॉइजेस जो है वो इस वाइडर फ्रीक्वेंसी रेंज में जो, जो भी सिग्नल होगा वो बेसिकली आपका अनवांटेड सिग्नल जिसकी फ्रीक्वेंसी इस रेंज में लाइक करेगी वो भी आपका इंक्लूड हो जाएगा एंड मैम मैम ऑप्टिकल अलाइनमेंट इन द स्लाइड्स लाइक यू हैव गिवन सिंकिंग माइंस एंड टनल्स मैम कैन यू प्लीज एक्सप्लेन दिस व्हाट आर दी एयर फील्ड्स ओके सो फॉर एग्जांपल यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट अ टनल आपको एक टनल है राइट देयर इज अ माउंटेन व्हिच यू वांट टू कट फ्रॉम दिस साइड टू दिस साइड आप इसके थ्रू एक टनल बिल्ड करना चाहते हैं सो दोनों साइड से अगर आप कट करना स्टार्ट करते हैं यू वुड लाइक इट टू बी एब्सोल्युटली हॉरिजॉन्टल इन दैट केस राइट अगर आप यू वुडन वांट कि एक साइड से तो वो यहां से काटना शुरू करे और वो टिल्ट होके इस डायरेक्शन में चला जाए दूसरी साइड से वो काट के टिल्ट होके इस डायरेक्शन में चला जाए so for those kind yes, of purposes what you, what you can do is that you can shine the laser light from here so that it goes exactly in the horizontal direction okay for those kind of purposes the next unit is quantum mechanics i think you might know a bit about quantum mechanics you might know that uh, usually quantum mechanics is applied only in the atomic domain jab aap electron ki baat karte ho ya aap atom ki baat karte ho ya proton ki baat karte ho ya neutron ki baat karte ho so usually on the atomic scale jab kabhi bhi aap kisi cheez ki baat karte ho aap tab quantum mechanics apply karte ho in our day to day life we do not apply quantum mechanics right uske liye usually aapko agar koi kahe ki mere paas ek mass है यहाँ पे एंड मैंने इस पे सर्टन अमाउंट ऑफ फोर्स अगर अप्लाई किया है देन एंड आई आई कैन टेल यू व्हाट इज द इनिशियल पोजीशन ऑफ दिस ऑब्जेक्ट लेट्स से इट इज एट एक्स एक्स इज इक्वल टू थ्री सेंटीमीटर एंड इफ आई टेल यू व्हाट इज द अमाउंट ऑफ फोर्स आई एम अप्लाइंग एंड इन विच डायरेक्शन आई एम अप्लाइंग द फोर्स देन यू कैन वेरी प्रिसाइजली प्रिडिक्ट द फ्यूचर ऑफ दिस मास की आफ्टर दिस मैनी अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम ये यहाँ पे होगा आफ्टर दिस मच अमाउंट ऑफ टाइम ये यहाँ पे होगा एंड सो ऑन सो यू कैन वेरी वेल you know predict the future of the particle in this case but in the quantum mechanics you cannot do that i'll tell you why you can't do that uh, and we'll talk about uh, that principle in detail after uh, maybe in this lecture itself or next lecture itself but you might have heard about the heisenberg uncertainty principle right which basically says that there is an uncertainty associated in the position there is an uncertainty associated in momentum and this always has to be greater than equal to h bar over 2 and you know h bar is basically h upon 2 pi and many times uh, i think nowadays it's also called as h cut uh, so if there is an uncertainty associated in the position that means you are saying that you do not know the position of the particle initially precisely because there is certain amount of uncertainty associated with the position one can argue that you can definitely make this uncertainty to be equal to zero but the moment you make this uncertainty to be zero your uncertainty in momentum is going to be infinite and vice versa if you say that you can measure the momentum very precisely but in that case your uncertainty in position would become infinite so if there is uncertainty associated with the position at this time itself then there is no way you can predict the future of the particle that is a very fundamental difference between classical mechanics and the quantum mechanics in the or in if you want uh, in the kind of theoretical terms classical mechanics is a very deterministic mechanics where you say with very assurance okay i have my particle at located at this point i am going to apply this much amount of force and i am going to predict the future with very surety whereas quantum mechanics is probabilistic in nature 
where you say that your particle has certain asso uh, uncertainty associated at this position. So that means if you measure the position of the particle at this point, there is this going to be a finite probability that your particle might be here or it might be here or it might be here. And how, what is that probability? That would be decided by the wave function, which we are going to talk later. But the main focus here is that because you do not know the present of the particle with surety, there is no way you can tell the future of the particle with accuracy or with surety. And this is the fundamental difference between the classical mechanics and the particle mechanics. Many times it seems that the, the quantum mechanics is a limiting case of classical mechanics, but that is not true. Classical mechanics is an approximation of quantum mechanics. Classical mechanics breaks down when you apply it on the atomic domain. Quantum mechanics has never failed us so far. So your classical mechanics is basically an approximation of quantum mechanics, which is applied when the dimension of the objects becomes much larger. So this is the fundamental difference between the classical mechanics and the quantum mechanics. Now we are going to talk about a couple of things before we go into the details of the quantum mechanics. And you might be familiar with uh, these things. The first one is the de Broglie hypothesis. Which basically states that a moving object behaves in a particular way as though it has a wave nature. First of all, it, is a, it was a hypothesis. It's not now a hypothesis because it has been uh, verified experimentally. But when de Broglie proposed this, there was no experimental evidence to support what he was saying. And hence, it was a hypothesis at that point of time. After he proposed this hypothesis, I think in 1924, in 1927, this was proved experimentally. And this was finally verified in this case. Now, what do we mean by this statement? The word here, moving object, is important. I'll tell you uh, very brief, uh, shortly why is that so. What his argument was that, because by that time, already it was established that your wave will have both, or sorry, your electromagnetic waves will have both particle as well as wave nature. So he said that if this is true for electromagnetic wave or photons, basically, that they can behave as a particle or as a wave. Agar initially, this thing we were assuming to be wave, and then you know Einstein, uh, uh, there was photoelectric effect, and then that verified that. Basically, your light wave is not simply a wave, but it can also behave as a particle, which is basically your quantum of light. So, de Broglie hypothesis was that just just wave assume if that can behave as a particle as well as as a wave. So that means whatever we were assuming to be a particle so far, it should also have both of the nature. It should also behave as a wave as well as a particle. This was his argument. It was simply based on the fact that because your photons or electromagnetic radiation can have particle and wave nature, hence every, every object should have a wave associated with itself and it can behave as a particle also, which was true nonetheless. So this was his simple argument. We know that in the case of electromagnetic wave, you have the momentum associated. Right, your momentum is basically energy over C, right? E is equal to PC in that case. Or you simply say that it is H over lambda. But De Broglie said that 
for the moving objects also. If from here I can say that lambda is equal to h over p for the photon or electromagnetic radiation, he said that in the similar way, when with the moving objects, we associate a wave nature, we can associate a wavelength and that wavelength would be given by h over p, where p is the moment, uh, momentum of the particle that we are talking about. And that is where the moving objects comes into the picture. Because if your object moves not moving, so that means uska jo momentum hai, which is mass times velocity, velocity is zero jayegi agar aapka moment, particle rest pe hoga, to ye wali jo term denominator mein aapki zero ho jayegi, aapki lambda infinite ho jayegi, which is a meaningless term. Hence, ye jo wave humne associate ki hai, moving object ke, kisi bhi object ke saath mein, ye tabhi applicable hai, jab aapka object hai, wo move kar raha hoga. It is applicable only in the case of moving objects only. So this was basically your de Broglie hypothesis. Another thing is that whether you are talking about the photon or you are talking about the particle, we said that everything can behave as a particle and as well as as a wave, whether it's a photon or any object that we are talking about. But none of them can simultaneously behave as a particle and as a wave. कोई भी चीज है, for example, अगर आप interference की बात करते हो, या diffraction की बात करते हो, तो आपकी जो light wave है, they behave basically as a wave. ऐसा नहीं होगा कि वो simultaneously as a wave और as a particle behave करेंगे. They are going to behave either as a wave or as a particle, depending from the situation to situation. Simultaneously, ये दोनों तरह का behavior वो कभी भी exhibit नहीं करेंगे, whether it is a moving object or whether it is a photon. They can either behave as a wave or they can behave as a particle. This is another. Now, how do we know? When do we have to apply the quantum mechanics? Or when we can switch to the classical mechanics. How do we decide that? If we talk about this wavelength associated here, which we said lambda is equal to h over p. If you talk about a human, and let's say the mass of human is 70 kg, and let's say that speed is uh, very large, let's say that he is moving with a velocity of 20 meter per second. You can calculate the lambda with associated with here, right? Your h is 6.62 into 10 to the power minus 34. Mass is 70. Velocity is 20, right? P is nothing but mass times velocity. I'm talking about known relativistic cases here. You know what are the known relativistic cases? The cases where your velocity is much, much less than the speed of light here. Because if relativistic cases, hote hai, aapka jo mass hota hai, wo, uh, you, you, you need to introduce an, another parameter as with mass here. But let's stick to the known relativistic cases where your velocity is much, much less than the speed of light. If you do calculate this wavelength, this comes out to be 0 0.47 into 10 to the power minus 36 meter. Now, if you talk about the size of human, let's say if it's six feet or something, then it is approximately 1.8 meter. You can compare these two dimensions here, right? This is much, much larger as compared to the wavelength associated here. Now take the another case, which is an electron. If you talk about electron, mass of electron is 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg. And inside an atom, an electron moves with the velocity approximately 10 to the power 7 meter per second. If you calculate the wavelength associated with this electron, you will get minus 34, 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 into 10 is to power 7. This comes out to be 7.3 into 10 is to power minus 11 meter. 
if you talk about the radius of hydrogen atom, that is approximately 5 into 10 to the power minus 11 meter. Now, as I said before, that everything is going to behave as a wave as a, and as a particle. But at one point of time, it is either going to behave as a wave or particle. Ab, wo particle ya wave kab behave karega? How do we decide it? It would depend ki yahan pe, for example, look at this case. The wavelength associated with this object. How does this compare with the size of the object? If you look in the case of electron, your order is similar. It's 10 to the power minus 11. And here also it's 10 to the power minus 11. So if the wavelength that is associated with the moving object, if this is comparable to the size of the object, or size of whatever it is interacting with, whatever it is interacting with. That would decide that if it is going to behave as a wave or as a particle. Agar wo comparable hai, to aapka jo object wo wave ki tarah behave karega, or agar wo extremely, extremely mismatch hai dono mein, to aapka jo particle hai, wo ek object ki tarah behave karega. And this is the reason why electron is going to behave as a wave and we humans behave as classical objects. So this is a rule of thumb. How do you decide ki kab aapka particle wave ki tarah behave karega, kab aapka particle jo hai, wo ek object ki tarah behave karega. As I said before, this de Broglie hypothesis was basically a conjecture by de Broglie. There was no experimental evidence. But soon after, there was an experimental evidence. We know that, for example, if we have two slits and I have a source here, we have already done this kind of diffraction pattern, the double slit diffraction pattern here. You know that what would happen if I use a light source here. And let's say if this is your screen. If you use it as a light source, you do expect a diffraction pattern to appear here. Now, what if rather than using this light source, let's say, for example, I use the sodium lamp here, rather than using the sodium lamp, Let's suppose that we use a bullet gun. Mass of the bullet is probably going to be, let's say, 10 gram or so. We would not be seeing any diffraction pattern here. Your bullet is either going to pass through this hole or it is going to pass through this hole. Whereas if this is an electron gun, and you shoot electrons from here, you will still see a diffraction pattern on this screen, which is an experimental evidence that your electrons are going to behave as a wave. And it's very difficult for us to imagine that electron being a wave because we are so used to treating electron as a particle usually. In our mind, we have a well-defined you know, this is going to be electron. It has a certain mass associated with it and all those things. So therefore, we cannot visualize electron being a wave particle and saying that it is going to spread out something like this, the way your electromagnetic wave or light wave goes over here and that at this point, it is again going to behave like this. It is very against our intuitions because we live in a classical world. So your electron shows wave nature. That was the experimental proof 
that your moving objects will have a wave length or a wave nature associated with them. You know who discovered the electron? J.J. Thompson, right? He was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering the electron, basically for proving that electron is a particle. His son, I think J.P. Th Thompson or G.P. Thompson, he performed this experiment and he was awarded the Nobel Prize for proving that electron behaves as a wave. So this was the experimental evidence that every moving object is going to have a certain wave associated with it and that wave will have a certain wavelength and that wavelength is going to be given by this expression over here. The second principle that we are going to talk about is Hasenberg uncertainty principle. which basically states that it is impossible to measure the exact position and exact momentum of any object at the same time. This means that we, you know the mathematical expression for this is greater than or equal to h power over two. This means that, for example, if I have an object here and after two seconds, let's say I have the same object somewhere here, I can measure the position of the particle precisely at this point. I can measure the momentum of the particle precisely at this point. The word at the same time signifies that. But I cannot measure the momentum and position precisely either at this point or at this point. This is the meaning of the word here at the same time. You can definitely measure the momentum and position precisely at different times. You can, let's say, measure the position precisely now and momentum precisely after, let's say, 1.2 seconds. You can do that. But right now, it is physically impossible to measure the momentum and the position of the particle precisely. That is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There is another uh, thing here, which is the conjugate pairs cannot be measured simultaneously. That means if you are moving in 3D, you will have X, Y, and Z coordinates. So this means that you cannot measure the X position and X momentum simultaneously. You cannot measure the Y position and Y momentum simultaneously. And you cannot measure the Z position and Z momentum simultaneously. But you can very well measure X and PY simultaneously precisely. There is nothing which is stopping you from measuring x, py, x, pz, or px with y, px with z precisely. So, if you conjugate pairs, you can simultaneously measure kar sakte with 100% precision or accuracy. That is your Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There is a simple way to understand it. And let me draw a diagram for that. Let's say that I have two objects. One object is, I'm representing it in this way. Let me stop here itself. One object, I'm putting something with like this. I do have the second object, which I'm representing in this way. So the first object is somewhere from here to here. Because your wave you have drawn is only from here to here. 
Now, if I write delta x and delta p x here, and let's call this as case one, this as case two. In the case of case one, your delta x, आप अगर पार्टिकल को मेजर करना शुरू करो तो क्योंकि ये वेवलेंथ यहां से यहां तक एसोसिएटेड है तो आपका पार्टिकल यहां से यहां तक ही कहीं पे होगा उसके बाद तो आपकी वेव फंक्शन जो है वो जीरो हो गई है राइट सो योर पार्टिकल हैज टू लाइफ फ्रॉम हियर टू हियर दैट मीन्स योर डेल्टा एक्स इज स्मॉल इन दिस केस बट अगर आप इस पार्टिकल की वेवलेंथ मेजर करना स्टार्ट करो आपके पास में यहाँ पे वेवलेंथ मेजर करने के लिए वन कंप्लीट वेव भी नहीं है यू डू नॉट इवन हैव अ सिंगल कंप्लीट वेव हियर so there will be an uncertainty or i should rather write large uncertainty in this case agar aapki lambda mein large uncertainty hai to aapka jo p hai which is h over lambda as per de broglie hypothesis agar aapki lambda mein large uncertainty hai to aapke momentum mein automatically large uncertainty hogi whereas if you talk about the second case सेकेंड केस में आपका वेव फंक्शन मच स्प्रेड आउट है सो ये पार्टिकल कैन बी एनी वे फ्रॉम हियर टू हियर आपका पार्टिकल यहां से यहां तक कहीं पे भी हो सकता है क्योंकि आपने उस पार्टिकल की ये वेव ड्रो की है दैट मीन्स आपके पार्टिकल की पोजीशन में जो अनसर्टेनिटी है वो अब आपकी लार्ज है बट अगर आप अब इस पार्टिकल की इफ यू वॉन्ट टू मेजर द वेव लेंथ यू हैव द सफिशियंट नंबर ऑफ वेव लेंथ इन साइड इट to measure the wavelength of this particle precisely so aapki lambda mein jo uncertainty hogi wo ab aapki less hogi as compared to case 1 of course aur agar aapki lambda mein less uncertainty hai to aapki jo p hai which is again h over lambda if uncertainty in lambda is less then your uncertainty in p is also small hence agar aapka delta x large hai to aapka jo p mein We are saying that P में अगर आपकी less uncertainty है, that means आपका delta P है वो small हो जाएगा. Whereas in the first case, when we are saying that your lambda will have large uncertainty, that means your P will have large uncertainty. That means your delta P will be large in this case. So this is another way to understand Hazenbel uncertainty principle. जब कभी भी आपका delta x small होगा तो आपका डेल्टा पी लार्ज होगा और जब कभी आपका डेल्टा एक्स लार्ज होगा तो आपका डेल्टा पी है वो स्मॉल होगा एनीवन हैज एनी डाउट सो फार दीज अनसर्टेनिटी दीज आर नॉट एसोसिएटेड विद द एक्सपेरिमेंटल सेटअप डजेंट मैटर इन फ्यूचर हाउ सोफेस्टिकेटेड अवर एक्सपेरिमेंटल सेटअप will be these uncertainties are going to be these uncertainty are inherently going to be always present in the system so these are the note the limitations of our experimental setups aisa nahi hai ki hamare experimental setup utne sophisticated ya advanced nahi hai so we are always always going to have these uncertainties associated and these uncertainties are Always there in between the conjugate pairs. For example, angular momentum के साथ में आपका delta theta होता है, तो उनके बीच में भी similar uncertainty का principle follow होगा. अगर आप energy के बात में बारे में बात करो, the similar uncertainty principle would say that delta e delta t is going to be greater than h bar over t. आपकी ये energy में uncertainty है, या आपके time में uncertainty है. This is between energy and time. You will have i'm repeating that between the conjugate pairs position momentum angular momentum ke sath mein theta hoga energy ke sath mein time hoga these uncertainties are going to be always always present there most of the time ye wala jo expression ki jo value hoti hai wo itni large hoti hai ki h bar over 2 tak wo kabhi pahunch hi nahi pati hai so at some places you might see that it is simply written that is greater than equal to h bar फैक्टर टू को इग्नोर कर देते हैं बड़ी सारी जगह आप सिंपली इसको एच भी देखो क्योंकि अनसर्टेनिटी ये वाली जो टर्म्स है वो इतनी लार्ज होती है कि वो इस लिमिट तक कभी पहुंच ही नहीं पाती 
I think I'll stop here. Anyone has any doubts in today's class? Ma'am, can you tell how can we measure X and PY simultaneously? That uh, is going to be a bit detailed. So uh, let me uh, tell you a simple way to do that. आप किसी भी चीज को मेजर करते हो फॉर एग्जाम्पल एक बहुत डार्क रूम है अगर आप उसमें एंटर करते हो इफ यू वॉन्ट टू सी समथिंग हाउ वुड यू सी इट आप एक टोर्च लेके जाओगे उस पर लाइट थ्रो करोगे राइट तभी आप ऑब्जेक्ट को देखते हैं ना फॉर एग्जाम्पल आपके पास में एक इलेक्ट्रॉन है एंड ये इलेक्ट्रॉन को आप इसकी पोजिशन को मेजर करना चाहते हो राइट अगर आप इसकी पोजिशन को मेजर करोगे कैसे मेजर करोगे आप कुछ ना कुछ लाइट इसके ऊपर थ्रो करोगे राइट वो लाइट स्कैटर होके वापस आएगी फिर आप मेजर कर पाओगे उसकी पोजीशन को सो व्हाट वुड यू डू इज दैट यू विल बेसिकली हैव अ फोटोन इंसिडेंट ऑन इट राइट अब वो फोटोन जब इसके ऊपर इंसिडेंट होगा तो क्या होगा कि आफ्टर दिस फोटोन हैज इंटरक्टेड विद दिस इलेक्ट्रॉन एंड लेट्स इस इलेक्ट्रॉन का कुछ इनिशियल मोमेंटम था तो इंटरेक्शन के बाद में क्या होगा एक स्कैटर्ड फोटोन मूव करेगा एंड ऑफ कोर्स दिस स्कैटर्ड फोटोन की जो एनर्जी होगी इट इज गोइंग टू बी लेस देन द इंसिडेंट एनर्जी और ये अपने एनर्जी का एक पार्ट इस इलेक्ट्रॉन को दे देगा और इलेक्ट्रॉन का जो मोमेंटम है वो अब चेंज हो जाएगा आर यू विद मी अप टू दिस पॉइंट ओके सो दैट मीन्स कि अगर आप यहां पर पोजीशन मेजर करना चाह रहे थे तो आपने उसका मोमेंटम जो है उसको डिस्टर्ब कर दिया है और आप जो कंजुगेट पेयर की बात कर रहे थे ये जो आपका फोटोन है ये जब आएगा और आप जब एनर्जी और मोमेंटम कंजर्वेशन प्रिंसिपल अप्लाई करोगे तो आप एक्स एक्सिस के अलोंग अप्लाई करोगे वाई एक्सिस के अलोंग अप्लाई करोगे और जेड एक्सिस के अलोंग अप्लाई करोगे राइट right? तो अगर ये मोमेंटम इनिशियल अगर इसका मोमेंटम एक्स एक्सिस के अलोंग था तो ये फोटोन का जो मोमेंटम चेंज होगा वो भी एक्स एक्सिस के अलोंग चेंज होगा एंड दैट इज व्हाई द कंजुगेट पेयर्स यही क्वेश्चन था ना आपका यस ओके थैंक यू ओके एनीवन हैज हैज एनी अदर क्वेश्चन मैम देयर इज अ फार्मूला फॉर द लाइक Laser that is theta is equal to one point two two lambda by d. Ma'am, how this is derived? It was used in tutorial sheet. Its derivation is from Ghatak's book. It is given. It is quite a long derivation. It is not the syllabus part. It is not the derivation part. So, if you want, you will see it in Ghatak's book. तो इट्स गिवन देयर इसका प्रॉपर डेरिवेशन जो है आई कैन सेंड यू द पेजेस फॉर दैट पर्टिकुलर डेरिवेशन यू कैन हैव अ लुक एट दैट डेरिवेशन ओके हां जी 